Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Email on Tap. I'm your host, Anthony Chuli, and today I'm thrilled to have as a guest Lily Crowley. She is the postmaster at Verizon Media. Lily, thanks so much for being on the program. Sure, thanks for having me. How are you? I'm good. Good. So tell me a little bit about how you got into the email industry and your story. So I um, worked for Network Solutions for years, which is one of the original domain registrars. And um, I did data warehousing and uh, actually sort of involved in their email system. It was a homegrown system. And then I worked, went to work for AOL as a data analyst in their anti-abuse team. And I initially was doing lots of anti-abuse work. And then I went to the MOG in San Francisco in 2013, met a bunch of people, and I realized that we had maybe gotten a little out of balance with um, treating the abuse side and not really paying attention to the postmaster side. So I came back and I said, you know what, I think we can do better. And so we decided that I would focus more of my time on the, the postmaster side, which actually ultimately makes the abuse side easier because we're, you know, scooping up the good mail and hopefully doing better with it and then um, giving the abuse team the ability to be more aggressive with the bad mail. So, um, so then over time it just became, I'm the postmaster of the mail system and um, that's just how it worked out. It's been great though. So For a lot of senders, there seems to be this, this misconception, certainly, <laughs> that postmasters are these evil gatekeepers and all they do is block my mail for no legitimate reasons. Right. Um, help explain the role of what a postmaster does and what you focus on. Right. So um, the most important thing is we want to make sure that we're not mistreating mail that's very good. So obviously things like banking mail, transactional mail, mail that people want, certainly person to person mail. Um, so we want to make sure that mail is getting in. And I think people sometimes feel uncomfortable saying, hey, this customer that's sending order fulfillment is getting blocked. And I know they just started warming up, but can you do anything? So we want to do something about that mail. We absolutely do not want those customers to not get their mail in because it gives everyone a feeling of uncertainty. The user's like, where did my order go? Where did my bank you know, transaction go? Where did my statement go? So we want that mail. Um, we obviously want senders to spend a little more time making sure that they are aware of the other mail that they're sending. And I think that's where people think that we're being overly aggressive. You know, Maybe they're not as aware of some of their shared pools or a customer that says, you know, I'm only mailing to engaged people, but they're maybe mailing to people that have already complained, things like that. It's sometimes it's, it's a lack of awareness of what their customer's doing, and it makes us look like we're being overly harsh. And then the other thing is the abuse system is always changing to fight spammers. Right. So the problem is we may make a tweak that takes care of like 90% of spammer mail, but also hits 20 to 30% of good mail and because that's nothing is perfect. And so we're constantly refining, but we can't just wait because the, everyone knows the life of a spam run is really short. And so sometimes you have to be aggressive. So the balance is trying to figure out what that sweet spot is of the mail we want um, and the mail we don't want. <laughs> and you know, trying not to be too overly aggressive in the process. So. Yeah, you, you touched on an interesting point. You're, you're talking about wanted mail versus unwanted mail, which I think is kind of an evolution of the historically defined spam versus not spam. Right. Um, on that note, what would, you, what would you recommend as far as kind of the basic fundamentals or best practices for optimal delivery for a sender? So I get asked this question a lot and I'm surprised the next thing I'm going to say, can you tell me what it is that you're seeing that's spam to you? And I'm like, really? <laughs> like, right. So I expect in this day that there's data available to people and you should be looking at the same things we're looking at. Sure. Are we anti-abuse people of a larger scale? Yes. But if I'm seeing pharmacy spam, this should not be a mystery. And I'm sorry if they're masking the mail and making it look like it doesn't you know, it's not as obvious in a human readable format, you need to work on your mail. And so um, I, I think people, they rely on FBLs and FBLs are important, but remember if you've got a spammer squatting on your system, they wanna go to the spam folder because they'll never get complained about. And so they're flying under the radar. So there are other, uh -huh. there are other outbound things that people need to pay attention to. They need to pay attention to their pretties, their subjects. I mean, some pretty basic stuff, their trends. If you see a huge spike in mail, um, that's a red flag. If you see someone who's sending to the same number of people again and again and again, and no complaints, that's a red flag. No complaints is as much of a red flag um, for a new sender probably as much as too many complaints. So, um, but the other thing is, you know, expect that you're going to need to warm up very slowly on our system. It's, 
50 pieces of mail might not sound like a lot, but if you go from zero to 50 very quickly, the system may respond poorly. So um, the advice I usually give people is if they see any kind of deferring, pull back. Pull back until you start sending again and then keep going. And it's slow early, but if you do that appropriately, the system is can relax more with your mail versus, you know, like, ah, too much mail, and then it freaks out, and then you're upset, and then we're, our system's upset, and, and get, getting resolution actually, again, puts you slower. You have to kind of go back to the beginning, so. If I had to ask you one non-obvious recommendation or tip that you could share with marketers outside of like sending to engage and some of the more common recommendations, um, are there any non-obvious things that you would recommend a sender pay attention to that maybe they're overlooking or... Well, um, I mean, having come from a place of data analysis, if you look at, if you know your customer and you know your, a little bit about who they're sending to, and obviously that can vary depending on how many customers you're responsible for, the, the data will tell you information about what's going on. Um, and you shouldn't, um, shouldn't ignore those signals. Now, obviously don't give too much credence. Like if you have five seeds and two of them go to spam, that doesn't mean that you know, 40% of your mail is going to spam. Seeds sometimes can go to spam. But pay attention to what else you're seeing. Pay attention to, like if the user hasn't opened the mail, they're probably not interested in the mail, right? And maybe it's not perfect. Maybe your opens are not always calculating properly, but it, it should be a signal that if I'm seeing other people opening and I'm not seeing this set of users opening, then I could probably make an assumption that they're not as interested. So I don't think I think that a lot of the information is there. People just have to stop and they have to dig Pay attention. through the data. Mm -hmm. And also, sometimes you can't look at a million things at once. You maybe have to look at a subset of people and try to understand what you're seeing and then see if you can draw conclusions from there and then extrapolate from that. So that's kind of a foundation of data analysis. But that's the nature of, you know, you have to use whatever you have to build your picture. And if you ignore it, then you're missing out. So Well said. Um, Recently, there was the completion of the Yahoo and AOL mail infrastructures this past spring. Uh, what should marketers be aware of or know when sending to AOL and Yahoo subscribers now that that mail infrastructure is, right. is complete? And also, just so you, just so you know, Verizon.net, too, no, it's a smaller subset. There are still uh, pretty dedicated customers on those. Um, they're the same mail system. So um, while the user bases are different and you do see different user behavior, based on patterns that you've had in the past, the mail systems are the same. So sometimes people will say to me, I'm having trouble with AOL, and this week I'm having trouble with Yahoo for the same sender. I'm like, it's the same mail system. So obviously a week over a week, you could have a slightly different you know, experience in our mail system depending on other changes we've made to the abuse, but um, it's the same mail system. So people should treat it as such. So when as you're looking at volumes, you should treat if you're sending to Yahoo and you're sending to AOL, you're sending on the same IP from the same customer, those volumes now you got to send to the same place, you need to adjust accordingly. So um, I think a lot of places that were concerned about that early on have seen some of those challenges uh, go away with the initial ramp up, but um, they're the same system. And so people should treat them from that standpoint the same, the rules, everything. So. And does that apply also during warming, where historically marketers have kind of um, controlled volume by domain? They should, Those are all yes. But if together. they have concerns about their users and what's going on with individual sets, they should look at the domains separately from the standpoint of user behavior, because the the user demographics are different, and so they should not then say, "Well, this worked to AOL, so this will work at Yahoo," because those are different customer sets. Also, depending on who. If you're, you know, who you're mailing from. The AOL demographic does tend to skew a little older, so we get a different kind of customer, customer base. Yep. The AOL people have also been, um, some of them are paying customers and they've paid for other services through AOL and continue to do so. So it's a different kind of customer. So people should keep that in mind. Um, even though you're gonna treat the mail system the same way, you're gonna treat the customer bases differently, just like the data analysis we talked about where you should understand who you're mailing to. Yeah, so, well said, that's yeah. a good point. Um, you touched on this briefly earlier, but what are, what are, in your opinion, what are some of the more important metrics that senders should be paying attention to when trying to manage their email performance and deliverability? Um, so the first thing is, 
if you start to mail to us and you start getting deferred, you should slow down. <laughs> There's no question. I think people talk about, you know, the TSSARs, they hear about them a lot. They're on our website. I won't go into the details of that, but um, a deferral should be a good indicator to you that something's wrong. Um, and use those signals to determine whether you should be speeding up. Just because you have more mail to send, if the system is telling you, I don't want you to send right now, no matter, piling it on is only going to make your, your problem worse. It just exacerbates it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of patience involved. Sometimes you have to put the brakes on um, and make sure that you can, because if you can't get any mail in, then it doesn't matter how many times you try, you're still at zero delivery. So, or you're inching in a little bit of mail and then they, you know, I know people get the problem of the backed up mail causing other problems in their system. So, um, I just think people need to pay attention to what the system is telling them. Um, you know, if you're sending to us newly and you don't think that you're going to the inbox, so you're assuming that you might be going to spam folder based on user engagement and you speed up your sending, you're going to start getting deferred. It's as simple as that. So people should not ignore that. Um, then once, if they are in a pattern of sending that they like and they see engagement go down, then they need to do their, their homework. Right. You know, I can't magically make, I can help make sure if it's deserved that people understand why they're getting deferred and if there's things they can do to, to fix that. And I can help them understand why they might be going to the spam folder at times. Um, but I can't change if the user doesn't want to interact with your mail, we can't change that. If you're getting balked because you sent us too much mail and nobody's responding to it and you start getting balked, I can't magically make that go make the users want to engage with that mail and mark it as ham, right? So at the end of the day, we can only manage the things we can. If the relationship with the user is not strong, if the recipient doesn't want the mail, no amount of anything is going to fix right. that. So. Um, and I think people should, you know, it, it's still a basic concept of you need to send mail people want to look at. So it goes back to wanted mail versus unwanted mail. Exactly. As simple as it sounds. Exactly. It, it true in a lot and of I know cases. there are more things available to us and the system's more complex, but you can't just ignore the history of what you did. And you can't force engagement. Right. 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 So like when I used to work in data warehousing and network solutions, I worked in the marketing team for a while and I would pull all the mailings. We were very basic. This was before all these systems that do it. I used to pull the uh, recipients. I'd figure out who we were going to mail to based on what they, products they owned, what we thought they might need. And then also based on how they'd responded to previous mailings. So I would look back a year, we mailed to them then, they didn't respond. So I'd pull out people and say, no, we're not going to mail to them. They didn't respond to this. We had kind of like a life cycle of it. And I paid attention to that stuff. It was really painful to keep track of because I had to make my own database of users and their responses and keep it over time. But we did it. And we did it because we wanted to make the mailings we were sending really effective. And we wanted people to feel like when we sent the mail, oh, cool, this is the next thing I thought I would get for my life cycle of products. So you just can't that doesn't just go away because you have new, nice new tools. You still should be looking back at your data and seeing who's interacted with you. What did they buy? Do they really want this? The data <laughs> tells mail. the story. Yeah, exactly. So, um, We'll shift gears and talk about uh, AI and machine learning, certainly disrupting and finding their way into multiple use cases within digital marketing. Um, how do you feel about uh, its influence or possibilities in delivering deliverability monitoring services? I mean, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, but once again, I think if you are not, you're just saying, oh, the system will know and just shoving everything through and not really paying attention to the, the signals you're getting back. Also, AI is great, but if you're not training on a constant basis, it's only as good as the last time you've trained your data. So um, you have to, it, it requires care and feeding. Um, what worked three weeks ago because you had a new product isn't going to work now, if you've sent a million mails about the same thing, right? You can't just rely on the same things being effective. So I think there's a lot of potential, but I don't think that means that we ignore the basics of how we send mail. So, I mean, it's a great, but we have our own AI systems and they're not uh, foolproof either. So obviously, True. otherwise we'd all be out of a job because we wouldn't have any more spam, <laughs> right. right? And that's, well, here we are. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I, I mean, they're great effective tools and I think there's a lot to be done. But there's been research that showed, I think it was called Blue um, Ocean, 
um, I forget the name of it. Big, it was basically a machine that played chess and then it played chess and beat people. But when it got to a certain level of player that it was playing, a human, the, the machine couldn't beat the human. But when you combined a machine and a human, they could beat anybody. So there's a, there's a blend of, I have this data available to me, but a human sometimes needs to intervene and say, what should we do next? So don't just say, oh, we're running this program, it works, we're done. So There's been a shift recently um, around domain reputation, playing much more of an importance and an, an impact to sender reputation than historical IP-based reputation. Um, is IP reputation still important? Should senders still be paying attention to reputation tied to their IPs? Or where's kind of the balance in domain versus IP reputation, in your opinion? So it can vary for different receivers. It depends on what your system is. Um, they both play a role. Um, so if you have a really bad domain reputation, you can be sending on clean IPs and that won't last you forever. The, also, you can have a great domain reputation, but if you send on IPs that have a problem or you don't pay attention to good sending practices, you're still gonna have a problem. So they, they go hand in hand. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, we would look at things as brands, which are, you know, as is, is associated to its domain. It's like saying your phone number is your personality, mm -hmm. right? It, your IP is just a method of sending something. Um, so I think over time we'll see more domain influence, but it's still a process to get that to, in the shape that it needs to be for us to be able to rely on it. So. Um, they're both important. Recently, there's been a lot of evolution and changes in the inbox experience and enhancing with new features and functionalities the way that consumers interact and engage with brands and email within the inbox. Um, do you feel like this is influencing in a positive way the way that the recipients engage with brands with all of these new like AMP for email and dynamic email and all these other kind of rich features that help uh, uh, recipients engage in, in new and exciting ways with brands? So I think it depends on the person um, and the degree to which there's, for example, some interaction happening in the inbox. So I know some people are really bothered if an email moves to a different folder based on what the receiver thinks should happen with the mail. So there's a lot of people feel very territorial about their mailboxes, right? And they don't want something to happen to their mail. They want their mail in a certain way. So um, I think emails got a use case that a lot of other communication methods don't have, right? You're not going to get your power bill via text. You might get a reminder about it, but you're probably going to get notification that you need to pay your bill, the amount, you know, sensitive information in email. So you have to, I think there's definitely opportunity to have more information available to the user from their email box. So for example, your flight information comes in and then it automatically gets added to your calendar. Things like that where you're integrating other services around email where it makes sense. Or, hey, I'm shopping and I'm gonna go by the store that I like and I got an email box in my inbox. It, there's some That's use right. case for, I'm walking by the store, my email now makes itself known to me. But that's also a privacy issue. You have to turn on location services, you know, you're now broadcasting where you are and that you're near a store. So I think um, there's a lot of potential. I think they need, people need to be very aware of how people feel about their privacy. And it isn't a yes, no every, for every person. Today, I could be like, yeah, I'm so excited. There's this sale. I'm going to go to that store. Tomorrow, I'd be like, I didn't really want you to know I was here. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Same person, different experience. That's the same reason people will mark the same sender as spam one day and not the next, even if they want the mail. So, It's interesting, and I think that that's a perfect dovetail on my next question of you've, you've been in email for quite some time. What makes email so unique and its adaptability over the decades with all of these new messaging channels and emergences of, of new ways to communicate and market to people? Uh, we've all heard the critics, email is dead, chanting yeah. from the rooftops, but in your opinion, looking back, why is email so unique and how has it been able to survive right. this long? Well, I mean, my opinion is it's persistent. So texts are nice, but they sort of disappear based on the current way we look at, interact with our texts in our devices, which is usually mobile. Email, you can store it. Um, it's... You can copy it easily, you can interact with it, you can forward it. I mean, you can search on it if you have a, a powerful enough search engine. Um, and I think some of the benefit of that is that, so text, 
a lot of it is driven by the device owner or the operating system of the mobile phone that you have. But because we have another layer in there of mailbox providers, they're providing experiences through their software that make it more what users want. So I think you have another layer away from just your device and your operating system of people providing value to you. So um, I don't think, I mean, you, you know, Facebook Messenger is great. Instant Messenger is great. You know, WhatsApp, text, those are all great. I'm not going to do real actual business there. I don't mind talking to a customer service department through one of those. But like, I'm not going to get my order confirmation there. I'm not going to be able to find it again. I'm not going to remember what platform I had it on. You know what I mean? It just, it, they're not integrated right now. That might be a potential place for email to go mm -hmm. is sucking some of that information in. But right now, if I want to figure out what did I buy in 2015 when I had that company or that company came and painted my house. I'm, we're doing this now. Oh, I could search for the, the company that did painting for me. Oh, here's the quote that they gave me. I can call this company and see, have them come do a quote because we were happy with their work. And that's actually a lot easier than if I had like had a paper receipt that I stuck in a file somewhere and now I'd have to like empty my brain to figure out where I put that receipt. So there's a lot of places for it to really a utility for people to do things. That's so. interesting. It's a very interesting point of view and, and something I haven't really thought about is the efficiency of almost archiving and storing. And it's very easy to search. I am the than... archive guru. I archive and scan almost everything I can. I mean, I even did my kids like um, some of their school records and I could go into meetings and they're like, well, we can't access the record right now. I'm like, and you find it right on your right phone. Right on there. I PDF things. I had access to things. I had naming conventions. I mean, I'm a little bit of a freak, <laughs> but the point is it's available to you and it, it makes things that can get very disorganized become very organized really quickly. So, and if you manage your email box well, it can become your reminder system. It's another fail safe besides your calendar of ways that you don't miss things that you need to do. Sure. So, um, so it can be a distraction and I would be the first to admit that, oh, shopping, you know, but it also can be a huge productivity tool. And so I don't, I can't say that about the other communications for platforms that I use, you know, with the exception of text, hey, you need to go do this, you know, to directly to someone. So. We're going to have some fun for our last question. It's going to be a lightning round. Oh, I'm going God. to ask you four questions okay. that require brief responses. How brief? Uh, Define brief. Lightning just, round. Okay. Fairly brief. Okay. Okay. You decide. Okay. First one. You ready? Yeah. Best career advice you've ever received? Um, look out for yourself first. I mean, the companies, they are interested in you and they care about you, but if things change, um, they're not going to be the one who has to pay your mortgage or look after your family, so make sure you always take care of yourself. So. Most important lesson you've learned in the industry? Um, keep people happy, <laughs> not to the point where you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, but the reality is uh, you could be doing a fabulous job. Your team can one big executive escalation to the CEO of your company and things can get ugly really fast. And most people, even though the reason they might escalate doesn't seem very important to you, there's a reason behind why they're upset about something and you need to address that because it will come back to you. And that's why people were like, are like, I don't want to bother you. I'm like, I'd rather you come to me right. than my CEO has to find the chain all the way down to someone who can fix this problem. Bad for everybody. So, Biggest pet peeve of yours that you see from senders? Don't forget the basics. <laughs> come on now. I mean, do your research, do your work. I'll have people come to me and say, do you think this is a good sender? I'm like, I don't know. The who is creation date on this domain is like two days ago. What do you think? Yep. Stuff like that where like, let's use all the resources available to us. Let's check LinkedIn. Let's check Facebook. Let's see what kind of company this is. You'll know, you know, you do a Google search and you come up with an address that looks like it's not a real place. It's some shady looking building and they've got a PO box in that building. All of these are indicators that you have a problem. And so pay attention. You're a detective. Do your work. And then come to me if you're, and I'm fine with people coming to me and saying, this is what I've done. This is where I'm lost, but don't come to me with a slash 24. And they think, I think they're fine. And dude, I'm not here to fix your life. Right. I'm just, you know what I mean? <laughs> like I can't anyway. So do your work. So before you come to me. <laughs> Last question. This is a opportunity for you to stand on your soapbox. Uh, what accomplishment are you most proud of? 
Um, back to when you asked about how I got into email. When I went to Mog the first time and I kind of got a, whoa, this is bigger than I realized, you know, kind of the scope. Coming back and saying, you know what, we're not doing a very good job. We need to do a better job of supporting senders. I'm like, if we can't go to Mog and trust people who are in our anti-abuse community that are vetted, who are we trusting? And I'm like, all we're doing is putting everybody in the middle and trying to figure out who's bad and good. We should lift the good out of the middle, mm -hmm. let the bad, really obviously bad ones fall through, and then deal with the middle. And so that philosophy has really taken um, where I work and with our team. And it's just nice to see that people see not only that it's important, but that there's value in it because it actually makes less work if we do a good job at taking care of the, you know, the good um, senders that are vetting their mail and, and sending you know, responsibly. So. This has been an awesome interview. Oh, and I'm good. so happy that I was able to sit down with you and have Great. this. So thank you very much. Sure, thank you. You're welcome. And thanks everyone for tuning thanks. in. We hope to see you on another episode of Email on Tap.